Met Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let me uh, preface what I'm about to say with this. I was a weird child. As an example, at 10, I had a birthday party, uh, and it was all monsters. Uh, some of you won't know what this means, but... We showed monster movies on an old 16 millimeter projector because we didn't have videos back then. Uh, we, we dressed up like Halloween and we, we put monster posters all over the house and I was strange, you see. So it will come as no surprise that like many a young person, when in 1976 the Omen movie came out, I was all about the book of Revelation. If it was about spirits and possession and evil and the second coming, if it was about the epic battle of Jesus and the devil, like in the cartoon series South Park, then I was all about Revelation. But of course, I did not uh, know anything other uh, other than uh, the beast's number. And all of that business. It was all quite spooky and potentially fantastical. But I had no training. I didn't understand the context in which the book was written, this book of Revelation from which we read today, or that it was more about the Roman Empire, the promise of hope and the political notion of the reign of God and what it had to say about life today, how it was bigger, God's reign is bigger than any reign of a despot. I didn't understand that it was heavily debated and almost didn't get get put in the Bible. (laughs) I didn't know it was uh, 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 hotly debated or that there were urban myths about numerology weird predictions. As a kid, all I knew was it was some freaky stuff, and I was into freaky stuff. But this Sunday, we read it, and it's the first Sunday we're going to read a series. It's the only season, it's the only time in three years where we will have successive readings from the book of Revelation. So it's important for us to think about the lens from which to view it, especially in Easter season. What a strange time to have it put before us, or maybe not. So I'll take the opportunity by considering the words from our passage. You can get it out if you want to follow along. Jesus Christ, it says, is the faithful witness an interesting way to think about Jesus as a faithful witness. But he's the witness of the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom of priests serving his God and Father, to him glory and dominion forever. He is the Alpha and the Omega, Omega who is and who was and who is to come, right? So this is... This is about Jesus right here. When we shuffle away the historical context and we remove the oppressive powers of Rome from the book, when we set aside the fall of the temple in Jerusalem, which had probably just taken place, when we set aside the metaphor of God's grand end of gathering, the great in gathering, or the weird, freaky, macabre overlays of popular movies and myth. What we're left with is deep spirituality 
deep theology. We are presented with an understanding of who this Jesus Christ of Easter is. Let us take it apart. Christ is the first faithful witness. Christ's death and resurrection is the faithful witness of God's love for humanity. Je Jesus was the firstborn of the dead. It is in his death and resurrection that we put our faith that we too shall be resurrected. Think about the passage from John, right? If you have not seen yet, you believe, blessed are you, right? You, you understand and hear the witness without seeing. This is for us a sign. He is a witness. He was a witness to the disciples, a witness to Thomas. In scripture, he is a witness to us that we too shall be resurrected. Perhaps in our communities shall be resurrected. We trust and see Christ as the first fruits of the gift of eternal life, witness to the women and to the other disciples. Christ then, we are told, is the ruler of the kings of the earth, meaning this, that Christ's freedom and kingdom is not of this earth and instead frees us, you and I, as siblings, right, as kin, to be the family of God, that we are free, released from competition for resources and power, and that we are enlivened by the Holy Spirit to create a different way of living together. We think of that predominantly now as church, but it is to be community first, to be a Christian community. Christ in the book of Revelation is echoing the love of God which binds us together, which makes us, as we will pray later, citizens of God's kingdom kin to each other. Christ loves us and frees us from our sins as well by his cross, the Easter image of grace and a sign of forgiveness and mercy for all humanity, a grace that moves forward from that moment on and pulls us, invites us into the work that God has for us. John, in the book of Revelation, understands a theology whereby God's Easter action is our hope at death and our hope of forgiveness for our sins and an invitation into service. Think of that. God forgives our sins. No matter what broken road as the country song goes that has brought you here to this moment, no matter the sin you have committed, those secret ones that you keep inside and would not utter aloud, God has already forgiven even those. And by that, we are given this freedom then to live with each other. Of course, some of the problem is uh, we're not quite as forgiving as our Lord Jesus, are we? And so the problem we have is maybe not so much with my sin, but all those other sins uh, we see each other committing. That's the problem we have. But we should remember that the freedom is for them as well, you see. That's what enables us to be bound together in love. It's not our love. We aren't bound because I love you or you love me. We're bound because God loves me and loves you and therefore releases all of those boundaries that we hold to keep our, our communities closed from one another. And finally, service. The work of mission is both a sign of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and is an offering. Remember the words again from John's gospel. I'm sending you out. Peace be with you. I'm sending you. Take this peace with you out into the world. It's an offering that we make through the Holy Spirit given in thanksgiving to the God whose life in Jesus Christ and the work of God has brought us both the freedom through the cross and the hope of resurrection at our end. And finally, we recognize the reality that God is greater. God is greater than any moment. 
at any time, in any year, in any life cycle, in any political or news cycle, that God is greater than all of that. And our faithlessness of not being able to see that even in the midst of the worst times, no matter what they are, God draws us to God's self. That this is happening even in this moment. For the God who we see in Jesus loves us and wishes to be with us. And that this God is forever from the beginning of creation and after. A God who is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and our end. This is a powerful witness. And it offers all of us some freedom, I believe, to have courage first, to recognize our own belovedness, our own gift of belonging. Courage then to welcome anybody into the arms of the faithful community because God loves them and forgives them. And then courage to take a step into our future for God is already there waiting for us. And that is a gospel worth living. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter, at Texas Bishop, and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.